Now that we have talked about how space works in D&D, let's cover how sailing ships in space actually work because there is a lot of magic involved. If you haven't seen my last video, I would highly recommend going back and watching it so that you can understand this one. But today, let's talk about distances because yeah, space is big too big, and without magic you aren't gonna get far at all. Gnomish engineering and smart use of black powder from certain crystal spheres have allowed for chemical propellants and explosive mixtures that allow one to move their ship, but these are seldom poorly understood and move too slow for normal long-term space use. A ship with any of these non-magical engines could only move a max of 17 miles per hour. Obviously this is so slow that you would literally never make it to any planet and that's why this sort of technology is only ever used for bigger space stations and really only for course correction. The law of the land is to use magic to move through space and the way that you go about doing it is what everyone in space calls spell jammer helms. A spelljammer helm is a magical chair that has been enchanted to link with a spellcaster. When the spellcaster sits on the chair, it connects the individual with the ship to the point where the ship feels more like an extension of his or her body. Quote, the wizard or priest who uses a spell jamming helm deals with two levels of reality. In the first, they are in their own body and aware of the actions around them. They may talk and converse with others normally, though they may not move or cast spells while at the helm without breaking contact with the spell jamming device. The second level of reality is a larger, expanded consciousness in which the spellcaster feels the ship he is in as an extension of his own body. The ship itself, to the limits of its gravity plane and the air envelope, feel like a bubble under the control of the spelljamming mage or priest. This concept of linking is important for the spelljammer helm to function. End quote. Once the connection has been made, then it is merely a matter of willing the ship to move, and the ship will move. Quote, Moving through space is no more than mentally visualizing the distance and direction that the ship should move and willing the ship to move in that direction. The feeling has been compared with moving a limb that has fallen asleep. A pins and needles sensation, though not as painful as its analog. The helmsman is aware of the actions of others on the ship, as if he stood on the aft deck. The general movements of crew and officers do not register directly unless the spell jamming mage is paying attention. Combat under the helm is a frightening but usually non-lethal prospect. The helmsman is aware of damage to the hull as bright flashes of pain, but can easily maintain control. In certain circumstances, a critical hit, the pain can knock the helmsman out, slowing the ship to a stop. Many helmsmen have described the sensation of being merged with the ship, likening it to the feeling of personally flying amongst the stars. Sometimes they have a tendency to look down on warriors, rogues, and others as mere passengers in the marvelous ship that the mage or priest has become." End quote. Now the whole ship doesn't just move with magic, that's because what the spelljammer helm does well is move in a straight line, and, and that's its main purpose. When it comes to tactical movements like those in combat or even something mundane like parking your ship, you do need a crew for help. Generally speaking, turning around or careful maneuvers are actually done by the crew using things like wings on the ship or the sails or things of that nature. The spelljammer helm can can move in this way, but it is clunky and imperfect. And like I said, what it does well is move in a straight line, and boy, does it do that well. A ship with any kind of spell jamming helm, regardless of the type and regardless of the pilot, moves at about 100 million miles a day, or about 4 million miles an hour. To put this into perspective, using a spell jamming helm, you could get from Earth to Mars in about 12 hours, or to Pluto in about 36 days. Where the type of spell jamming helm and the type of pilot starts to actually matter is in combat and in tactical speed. The better the pilot and the better your helm, the faster that you go in these normalized speeds, but in long distance travel, the speeds are always the same. 
Now, spell jumping helms are impossibly rare. That's because only one race has truly figured out how to create them in mass, and that race is the mysterious arcane. There has been tales of mages who have managed to create their own, but it is always something that takes a very long time and requires great power to do so, whereas the mysterious rays of the arcane are always present in every space city willing to just sell you some though at an extravagant prize. The cheapest helm that you can get is a minor helm which goes for about 100,000 gold pieces or the monetary equivalent in your crystal sphere. The other option would be the major helm which goes for about 250 thousand gold pieces. The main difference between the two, between the minor and the major helm, like I said before, is the speed that they will go during tactical movement. But a huge difference too is the size requirements for the ships they will be installed into. A minor helm can move a ship only of up to 50 tons, whereas a major helm can move a ship up to 100 tons. To help you guys a bit with perspective, a war galleon is about 40 tons, and this is generally the size that most bigger combat ships tend to take, between 40 to 60 tons. Anything higher than that, and typically they become hard to maneuver and of course quite impossible to park in any civilized outpost without even mentioning the impossibly difficult process that one would have to go through in order to build something as massive as a 100 ton ship. Remember a couple of videos back when I said that the only way elves managed to build their 100 ton armadas was using high magic rituals because otherwise, well, good luck. Now, in any case, these all-purpose spelljammer helms are great as long as you have spellcasters who can use them. Any person that can cast spells will do, paladins and, and rangers included, though as soon as you connect to the helm, all of your magic will be tapped out for the day as the chair sucks it all for travel, regardless of how long you actually use the thing for. Because of their ease of use and practicality, many races use this from human clerics to elvish wizards to even lizardfolk shamans. Human ships with these helms are extremely varied, as humans always are, so you can go from seeing what they call groundling designs like literal water ships to more space-oriented human designs like the popular and beautiful tradesmen. This is by far the most common ship in civilized space, used by really any creature who can use a spelljammer helm. The dragonfly is also very popular and also designed by humans. Specifically when it comes to the Forgotten Realms, the, the ones actually creating spacefaring vessels and actually having somewhat of a presence in space, are what we call the Shao in Shaolong. This is the map of Toril, where 5th edition D&D is set. All adventures are set in this tiny speck of land over here. Well, this here is Karatur, the Empire of the East. This here is ruled by the Shaolung Empire, and they are the only ones really in Toril who have a dedicated space presence. Other than them, the elves of Evermeet have a couple of ships that can fly to space, but that's that's basically it. If you want to land on a planet, generally speaking, you take off the Spelljammer helm and then land mundanely with other magical ways, lest you actually risk getting rubbed and being stranded. Most groundlings don't really care about what's happening in space, and most space furs don't care about what's going on on the ground, so the two barely ever make contact with one another. In any case, elvish ships look mostly like butterflies, like the very common flitter design and the elvish man of war. There is a strict policy between elvish space furs that nobody's actually allowed to mess with the delicate and standard designs of their ships, which is why they all look the same. Unlike the humans who don't really have a particular allegiance to any one group, elves are actually extremely well organized and possess currently the strongest fleet in known space across the crystal spheres. Another race that uses the standard spell jammer helms are the lizard folk, though these are a little bit different from the brutish ones that you're probably accustomed to from down on the planets. See, lizard folk are like Superman. They actually get energy from the sun, so those in space are much more intelligent than the ones on the swamp down below. We will have a video about them eventually. But their ships are flavored to them, with the popular wasp being the most common lizard folk vessel seen in space. The entire lower decks of the ship are flooded with water for use by the lizardmen to sleep or to keep their mascots like their schools of fish or sharks. 
Sharks. And lastly, we have the gnomes. There is no specific design when it comes to gnome ships because every single one of them is unique. See, tinker gnomes can't ever help themselves from modifying any ship that they get their hands on, adding more and more modifications over time, trying to solve problems that maybe never really existed in the first place. Generally speaking, when they solve a problem with an invention, that invention will create a new problem which will require another invention to solve, and so on and so forth. The end result is a mad construction of gears and valves and vents that nobody but the gnomes would actually be able to understand. We might do a video on each of the races and how they behave in space if you guys actually do enjoy these videos because there really is a lot and we would have to do a video on each specific race. But anyways, all of these that we just talked about are races that can use the spell jamming helms without a problem. There are, however, other races that are not quite as blessed with the ability to wield magic this freely, and for those races, the mysterious arcane have developed different ways of space travel. Because Mind Flayers don't traditionally have access to magic, they use a special helm called the Ceres Helm, which looks like a collection of two to five minor helms connected together. The helm uses their psionic power to fuel the artifact in order to move the ship. The more Mind Flayers connected to the Ceres, the faster the ship will go. The weakness of this system is that if a Mind Flayer dies while connected to the series, then the other connected Illithid have a chance of automatically dying as well, as they're all mind connected together. The other weakness is that this type of helm can only support ships of up to 50 tons. Now, the most popular and by far the most common ship used by the Illithid is what they call the Nautiloid. The coiled shell of the ship provides comfort to the Mind Flayers by protecting them from the rays of the various suns, since Mind players actually hate the light. They are not harmed by it, like, I don't know, the drow, but it does irritate them. Now, on the other hand, a new system has been recently developed for the Illithid, which has sparked a lot of speculation and worry. They call these pool helms. They use the natural life pool of the Mind Flayers to power the artifact. They are exorbitantly expensive and of course delicate because brine pools are the reproductive method of the Illithid, but when in use by this pool, it is believed that they can fuel a ship of up to 200 tons, so literal motherships could be fueled with this system. The few that have ever been seen with this new system were used to transport the Illithid Great Old Ones. The Beholders are really interesting with their designs. Much like there are many different kinds of Beholders and subspecies of Beholders, it appears that they have created an odd inbred kind called an Orbus, a blind Beholder with milky skin over all of their eyes. They are described as pale and practically helpless on their own, bred with a single purpose to serve and use their energy to power the ship. A single Orbis can power a ship of up to 20 tons, two Orbises for 40, and a limit of three Orbises for a ship of 60 tons. Given how simple this method is, it is believed that other races could actually use an Orbis to maneuver a ship, but the Beholders guard them carefully and would rather disintegrate them than see them turned over to the other races. If, however, a Beholder was to sell an Orbis, they wouldn't take anything less than 300,000 gold pieces, or at least that's what the Orbis would sell on the black market. Their ships tend to be creepy and unique as well, which reflect the very unique personality of the Beholders that pilot it. Beholders think that they are the pinnacle of Beholder kind, and any Beholder that looks different from them must be eliminated and destroyed. This is why in space the Beholder Civil War is like the biggest source of conflict that you will tend to see. Beholder on Beholder action. Each type of Beholder will have their own unique style of ship and the mysterious arcane who builds these ships for them take great care to make sure that each ship complements the type of Beholder that it belongs to because any mixture would actually enrage them greatly. What's also interesting about space is that the cultures of many creatures and monsters are actually different than those on the ground. Beholders are too busy fighting the Great Beholder Civil Wars to really fight any humans or dwarves. Mind Flayers are still as deadly as ever, but their motto of hunting and seeking knowledge has somewhat shifted to explore and seek knowledge. 
Now, they steal six slaves and are still very much evil, but they don't mount full-scale wars against outposts as much as they would back on the underground in the Underdark. You see them in towns and in outposts trading off, and they understand that they must deal with civilization in order to find the truth of their existence. I guess what I'm trying to say is they're not quite as aggressive as you would imagine. Now, the goblinoids in space were obliterated by the elves in the last great war, which is why you don't really see goblins or orc ships anymore. In their stead, however, what you have is one massive common enemy, the Neogi. When you see a Neogi death spider, you either run or you attack. There is no in-between. This is their main vessel, and to give you perspective, this is 100 tons. This is a mothership. Nobody knows where their homeland is, but they only have one desire, and that is to enslave all the worlds. We can do a video about them as well eventually. Lastly, to finish up the video, we have the dwarves. Most dwarves don't tend to magic, and because of that, they have developed their own and unique type of space travel, which they call forges. Quote, the basic idea of the Forge is the same as the Spelljammer Helm, the conversion of energy into movement. In the Dwarves' case, the energy is not magical as much as it is creative. By building items within the Forges, the Dwarves generate the energy necessary to literally move mountains across the sky. End quote. Essentially, dwarves find a massive asteroid of at least 100 tons and at most 700 tons and then build or move in a magical forge inside. Then they mine the asteroid and create tools and objects with the mineral ore. The creative process of creation fuels the magic of the forge and moves the asteroid. To the dwarves, this is no ship, but a home. Now, the positive effect is that they can actually control entire fortresses with this technology as well as they can get to create beautiful works of art and craftsmanship that they can actually sell in outposts. The negatives are that the asteroid will eventually be spent, having been mined of all of its ore. When that happens, the dwarves simply find a different asteroid and move in, leaving the previous mountain derelict and empty in space. Many monsters, dragons, and bandits use the abandoned dwarven mountains as lairs. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Man, it feels weird not to go too in-depth on, on, on a topic. I'm kind of used to just doing single videos covering everything there is to cover about a topic, but I'm, I'm really trying to go as, as basic as I can to just cover the most possible about space before we start going in-depth. So tell me what you guys think. Tell me uh, how you're liking the videos. And uh, if you want to, obviously, hear more about this. Next video, we're going to be covering the phlogiston and the actual spheres themselves, the shells. And I think we're going to actually go in depth on those. Um, it might be like a 20 minute video or something like that, just talking about those topics. But but yeah, I would like to thank my patron supporters, Zach Bowell, Rukato Fan, Barry Maskant, 5e Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Dr. Cowbell, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Schizia Boy, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Kush Bane, Dog Feeder, Brad Salazar, The Great Codini, Alisa Russell, Major Fail Gaming, Terry Culp, Morgan McCormick, and Mediocre at Best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.